We're going to be talking about something that's not very popular to talk about in our society. It's not politically correct to talk about it. It is, it is uh, something that a lot of people have become almost immune to. And what I'm referring to is sin. We are going to be talking about sin this morning. It won't be surprising the day that Charles or myself cannot get up here and preach the gospel without it being illegal in our society. That will not surprise me at all because people do not want to hear about sin. Even in churches across America, you, you have this word excluded from sermons because people just don't want to hear about it. They like to hear about Jesus as their Savior, but they don't want to hear what he is saving them from. In John 1 and verse 29, behold the Lamb of God. Well, they want to stop right there, right? Because they don't want to hear what Jesus is saving them from. That Lamb is saving them. Uh, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In 2008, uh, there were some bullies picking on a, on a, uh, on a seven-year-old boy. David Martin, this boy's father, intervened. And uh, because of that intervention, these gang of bullies um, stabbed this man with a sword and then began to beat him to death with golf clubs and cricket bats. Now, how many of you would say, in this situation, as we're thinking about this man who was beaten and died and uh, while his wife and children watched, how many, of us was, how many of us would say, well, you know, what's the big deal? And Jasper, just a couple weeks ago, we had a young boy, uh, I think he was like a seven-year-old boy or something, I don't know, maybe he was 11, um, who was found in a motel and he was dead. How many, of us, how many of us would say about something like that, well, you know, what's the big deal? Nobody would say that because we realize how horrible that is. We realize how terrible it is that that, that man was beaten to death. We realize how horrible it, it was that this boy is dead for no reason. But did we recognize, do we understand that God sent his son to die a brutal death that he did not deserve? Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3 starts um, a prophecy talking about our Savior. In Isaiah 53, starting in verse 3, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. This, again, is a prophecy about Christ, but what it tells us, friends, is that sin is a very big deal. We often forget what we're doing to Christ every time we sin, don't we? And I'm not talking about the sins we think are bad. I'm talking about all sins. Sin is the reason that Christ was wounded. He was the reason Christ was beaten and crucified. Every time we sin, we essentially crucify him all over again. And so I think it's important for us to talk about this topic this morning. Because Paul said in Romans 3 and verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. And verse 23 of that, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so the first thing that I want us to think about as we begin this lesson is that all of us have sinned. Every single one of us. Well, Brian, that's not what people want to hear. Nobody wants to hear that we're sinners and in need of a Savior, and I understand that. But we, we think, you know, well, those, those criminal deadbeats who beat that boy's father, you know, they, you know, they have sinned, but not me, not my own little, you know, I might tell a little white lie here and there, but, but I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not doing anybody any harm. And we think that sometimes, and, and that's where we're wrong, because every single sin, including that little white lie, is the reason Christ was brutally beaten and died. 
You mean to tell me that I'm no better than those deadbeats? Yeah, I'm, that's, that's what I'm saying, and I'm talking to myself too. In 1 John 1 and verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We've all sinned. It's something all of us can relate to. We all have this in common. Every single person in this room above the age of accountability has sinned. You know, I know a lot of us have different backgrounds and different, um, different, different things that we like, different interests. Um, some, of you, some of you may not like to get up in an airplane and fly. I don't know. Uh, some of you would rather sew or, or go to the beach or whatever it might be. We have different backgrounds and different interests, but every single one of us has sinned. I have never met a person who has not sinned. Have you? There is not one person in the city of Clearwater who's never sinned. We could get on an airplane and we could fly to Europe and there it'd be the same story over there. We could go to the deepest, darkest depths of Africa and every person you meet will have sinned. It is a common problem that we all share. Now, we know the bad people have sinned, but even the good people, the doctors and the lawyers and the, well, are lawyers good people? I don't know. I guess so, yeah. The bankers, the teachers, the elders, the preachers, yes, more, most importantly, I have sinned. There's only one person who has ever lived on this earth and did not sin, and that was our Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 4 and verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. And so as we think about this idea that seems to be so taboo in our society, remember we've all done it. Number two, our society tries to minimize it. Nobody wants to talk about it. If you turn on the news, every single problem that surrounds our country, every single problem that is in our homes, every single problem that is at the workplace, every problem that is at school is because of sin, almost. I suppose there's some natural disasters that, that, might not, that might not be the case from, but somebody was murdered. Somebody was drinking and driving and hurt somebody else. Somebody robbed a store. Somebody cheated on their spouse. Sin surrounds every problem almost in our society and all over the place. I don't know the last time that I heard a politician quote Proverbs 14 and verse 34. Do you? Proverbs 13 and verse 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. When, when we hear uh, them talking about all the countries that our problem faces within this country and, and all of their ideas to fix it, Never do we hear the word sin brought up because nobody wants to hear it. And they won't get reelected either, by the way. Um, you know, of course, we want the murderers uh, and we want the thieves and we want all those people to get caught and called out on their sins. But, but not my own little sins, right? Did you know in this country we have a national day of prayer? I think it was last month in May. In 1952, Congress passed the National Day of Prayer. And in 1953, P President Dwight D. Eisenhower was the first president to call all of the country to pray. And notice what he said, quoting Abraham Lincoln. He said that we should confess our sins to God and ask God for forgiveness. I don't know of any president since that has done that. Do you? That has called our nation to do that. And why would they? Because they understand that if they were to call upon the nation, they would have to begin with themselves. And who wants to do that? And so we have minimized sin to where it's not really sin unless it's murder. And then, you know, if it's an unborn baby, well, then it's not really murder either. And so some murder is even allowed in our country. Let me tell you something, brethren. The moment that you are lied to, the moment that you are, something is stolen from you, the moment that, that your spouse cheats on you or your children begin to rebel, that's the moment that you want justice for sin because you're going to have a new appreciation for why God does not want us to sin because nobody wants to be the victim of sin. It's not so bad when I'm the one doing it, but somebody's always a victim. But we don't hear about sin anymore. Even in churches, you don't hear about it. We've given, give, given different names to make it a little bit more palatable. We don't want to offend anybody. We don't want anybody to have to take responsibility for their lifestyle, and so we take the edge off of sin. We say something like, we're in a meaningful relationship instead of fornication. 
Well, an alternative lifestyle is so much better than a homosexual. Well, you have even the, the, the acronym, whatever it is now, and that sounds better than well, the LGBTQT. Is that right? I don't know. Anyways, that sounds far better than saying all of those words. That sounds like sin a whole lot more. Adult entertainment, what could be wrong with that? It sounds a lot better than pornography and lust. Indiscretion sounds better than lying or adultery. And then choice, of course, sounds infinitely better than killing an unborn child. We try to take the edge off of sin in our society, but friends, the Bible is not so gentle. The word sin is used 1,300 times in Scripture. The word iniquity, 288 times. Transgression, 186 times. And abomination, 136 times. There is no taking the edge off of sin in the Word of God. In 1 John 3 and verse 4, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin is just a violation of God's will. It's choosing my way instead of God's way. It's choosing self-gratification instead of humility that our Lord seeks. You know, we all have choices in life. Go ahead and turn to Joshua 24. And that's going to be a passage that's familiar to many of us. But we all get to choose whether or not we get up to go to work or... We sit on the couch and eat Twinkies all day. Or we have a choice to treat people with respect or to treat them harshly. We have a choice whether or not to live God's way or to make our own path. God has given us our own free will to be able to do that, and our prosperous country has taken full advantage of that, no doubt. Here in Joshua 24, 15, Joshua is trying to persuade the Israelites, just as we're trying to do today, to keep the nation out of sin and to follow God. In Joshua 24 and verse 15, again, a very familiar passage to a lot of us, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Some of you may have this on your refrigerator. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We need to bring back that attitude in our society. Amen? Recognizing that sin is a very big deal. We've all done it. Our society tries to minimize it, but it has devastating effects, and that's point three. Sin has a devastating effect. Maybe maybe you've heard the story of the boy um, who was giving his mother some trouble. And, and this, this boy, uh, every time he would give his mother trouble, this woman, this mother, would, would drive a nail into the wall. You ever heard this story? Every single time she would drive a nail, any time he did something wrong, any time he would rebel, any time he'd sin, basically. And so after a while, he began to see all of these nails in the wall, and he's thinking, man, I feel a little bit guilty about this. And so he went to his mother and said, how, how can I get... How can I rectify this situation? How can, I, how can I get these nails out of the wall? And she said, okay, I'll tell you what. Every time you do something good, every time you do something right, something you're supposed to do, I'll go ahead and take a nail out. And eventually he got all the nails out of the wall. But he was still upset. And his mother was thinking, well, why are you still upset? You got all the nails out of the wall. And he said, I know. But you know what? The scars are still there. The scars of those nails were still in the wall. Friends, that's exactly the way sin is in our lives. Sin puts a scar on anything that could be beautiful in this life. Sin puts a scar on every relationship we we have, and it scars, most importantly, our relationship with God. In 1 John 1 and verse 5, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. When we bring sin into our lives, we bring that darkness that scars our lives, and God can no longer be a part of it. We push God out when we sin. We separate ourselves from him as we talked about in the scripture reading. Our relationship with God is now broken and he will not hear us. Go ahead and turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 6. Sin has devastating consequences on our lives because it puts us at enmity with God, against God, in other words. It breaks our relationship with each other. Instead of having peace and harmony, you have division and suspicion. Sin never makes anything better. Tell me, tell me in your life, name one thing in your life that sin has made better. 
or it has made your life easier in some way, can you do it? I cannot think of one thing that sin has made better in my life. It does not make your marriage better. It does not make you a better friend. It does not make you a better employee or employer. It does not make you a better neighbor. It ruins everything in your life, even your relationship with yourself. Romans 6 and verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. But focusing back there on verse 16, a slave of sin is what we become because God cannot abide in the darkness of sin. In 2 Peter 2 verse 19, Peter says they promised them liberty. They themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. You should want something better for yourself. And so should I. Sin does not bring more self-esteem. It does not remove worry or doubt. It does not bring happiness or contentment. Sin doesn't uh, make you free from depression or give you a better attitude. It does not help you with your priorities. It does not bring out the best in you. All sin does is lead to more sin. You know, what do the alcohol commercials promise you? I mean, those things look so refreshing, right? It looks so enjoyable. It looks so exciting and comforting. If I just take this drink, I'm going to have so much more comfort in my life. But that's not what it actually does. They're offering something. They're promising something that they cannot possibly give you. Kind of reminds me of the Pringles commercial, right? Once you pop, you can't stop right? That's how sin is. You can't just have one. You just got to keep on going until it ruins your life. You, the sin of envy leads to, leads to cheating. The sin of pride leads to lying. The sin of covetousness leads to stealing. The sin of lust will lead to fornication or adultery. The sin of hate leads to violence. Sin will lead you down a path of destruction, and it doesn't take much. Just a little bit will do. In the days before GPS, you know, the mariner out on the sea He'd be taking, doing his charts and everything, and he'd be off by one degree. That's not much, right? Until you go 100 miles or so, and then you're lost. And it's the same way in an airplane, I suppose, but sin is also the same way. Just a little sin will lead you down a path where you do not want to go. How many people have woken up like the prodigal son one day and thought, how did my life get to where it is today? This is not what I expected out of my life. This is not what I envisioned for myself. This is not where I want to be, and it's because of sin. As the saying goes, sin will take you where you don't want to go, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay, and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. Proverbs 13, verse 15, Good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. Life is hard for a sinner. Much harder than it is for the... Think about your life at home. How much better would your life be if there was no sin in it? If your spouse never drank alcohol? If your your spouse treated you the way that that God says in his word? If If your children did everything they were supposed to do? If sin was never a part of your household? If you never sinned? If nobody ever lied to you? And nobody ever cheated on you? Nobody ever gossiped about you. Everybody always kept their word. Can you imagine how much better of a society that we would live in? How much better our workplaces would be if everybody was doing what they're supposed to be doing? How much better your home would be? And we contemplate those things and we realize very, very quickly how much pain and suffering is surrounded by sin. And much more than that, our eternal life will be much harder for a sinner as well. In Revelation 21 and verse 8, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Eternal life for a sinner means to live in a lake of fire and brimstone. You know, I just learned what brimstone was the other day. It's, 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 
and maybe I'm wrong, this is what somebody said in a lesson, but it's burning sulfur, basically, which is extremely hot. Is that right? Might be right. Sounded right when he said it, so it's got to be right. But anyways, I don't want to live there. I know that. I don't want to live any place that's a burning lake of fire, but our society is, is desensitizing us to sin, which is going to lead us there. And they're telling us, well, it's just okay, no matter what kind of life you want to live, even if it's not in accordance with the Word of God. You know, there are some points that if I come back, I'd, I'd like to make some time in regards to this topic, but I want to end on a good note here because there is some great news. There's some good news here. Jesus Christ did come. And he did die so that I might have hope. He was brutally beaten, a death that he did not deserve so that I could live. He wants a relationship with us. He was willing to even forgive those people on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Peter, preaching the first gospel sermon, said, Therefore, let the, all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified... This is your fault, he's saying, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they, were, they had the right response. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Well, that's good because all of us have done that. So we need that too. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine how much better your life would be and how much more you could accomplish for the Lord if, you, if sin was not a part of your life? Are you willing to stand up for righteousness in a society where it's not politically correct to talk about sin anymore? If so, then turn from your sin. God gives us the opportunity to do that. Christ came and died so that we could do that, so that sin does not have to be a part of your life anymore. Let me close with this thought because I heard it, I heard it a couple weeks ago at a men's conference and I thought it was really good. Did you realize if you are a Christian this morning, if you're a Christian, this is the closest to hell you will ever get. Did you realize that? That's a pretty good thought, right? But if you're not a Christian this morning, this is the closest to heaven you will ever get. That's a humbling thought. 